The Romantic period was a time when scientists and writers spoke to each other, wrote to each other, and indeed the scientific writing is of a wonderful quality of prose, and the scientists themselves often wrote poetry, but we'll come on to that. She worked as a young, young woman assistant to Joseph Priestley. And as you know, Priestley was doing work on the gases, artificial airs, and his work would produce what he didn't name as oxygen, but deflagrated air and so on. And he, to do that, he was using animal experiments. Very specifically, he was using mice um, in a vacuum, withdrawing all the air to see what elements kept the mouse alive. Now, one evening, the young assistant, Anna Barbell, she was 23 then, when she was packing up at the laboratory for the next day's experiments, she found the mouse who would be experimented on in a cage, waiting next to the vacuum tank. And she looked at the mouse, and the mouse evidently looked at her. And she wrote a poem, a poem in the voice of the mouse. For here, forlorn and sad, I sit within the wiry grate and tremble at the approaching morn which brings impending fate. The cheerful light, the vital air, oxygen, are blessings widely given. Let nature's commoners enjoy the common gifts of heaven. The young man from Cornwall was hoping for a cure for tuberculosis. Not such a crazy idea. If you could find the right gas that you could breathe, it might heal the infections in lungs. The gas he worked on um, was nitrous oxide, known to us as laughing gas, which has very many interesting properties. One, it's a euphoric. So Davy, being a young scientist, calls in volunteers to breathe the gas, all right? His Chief was Coleridge, the young Samuel Taylor Coleridge, straight from Kublai Khan. It's a year later, straight from the opium experience, he goes to breathe nitrous oxide, all right, with Davy. And here's from the notebook. Mr. Davy breathed a large dose of our gas at the same time as Mr. Coleridge. And it produced a prodigious excitement during which he exerted a degree of muscular power that utterly surprised a very robust bystander. I, he knocked him down. But he was so far from sinking, like some spent Pythian priestess, that his spirits were unusually good all day, nor has any languor succeeded since. In the period I'm writing about, everybody became fascinated by balloons. It became a fashion mode. You could buy entire dinner sets with balloon designs on it. You could buy a hat. You could buy a lady's garter with a balloon on it. Of course, from the balloon, you suddenly see the world differently. You see they flew over the big cities. You could see how the cities had developed, the importance of rivers within them, the impact of city and cultivation on the wild land and the rivers and the trees and the forests around it. So the first time we begin to get something that we would now recognize as a kind of environmental consciousness. And there is some comparison between the importance of those views and what happens when the astronauts first went round the moon. And the argument there is that also produced a whole shift in perspective. The world is different, the world is single, it's fragile, it's beautiful, it's the only one we've got. I think there is a sense that we are moving into a new age of wonder and that the cultures are talking together again and the history of science, the history of science itself is to me one of the great disciplines that will bring us all together.